Hello, everyone, and hello, people of the future. Uh, my name is Kevin Perlow, and I am the Technical Intelligence Team Lead at a financial institution. Today, I'm going to be discussing a concept uh, called financial payment standards. So I'm going to be discussing two standards here, the ISO 8583 standard, which is for cards, and the extensions for financial services standard, which is a, you can think of it as an API for doing, uh, for interacting with hardware on an ATM. I'm going to be discussing how threat actors incorporate these two standards into two pretty specific malware families, uh, fast cash for ISO 8583 and Inject Pure for extensions for financial services. And in the context of how these malware families work and sort of the inner mechanisms of them, I'm also going to be discussing the advantages and drawbacks that come with integrating these payment standards into a malware family. So jumping right in, uh, the first thing I want to discuss is ISO 8583. Now, ISO 8583, as I said, is a standard for financial card transactions. So anytime that you go to an ATM or anytime you go to a point of server or point of sale device at a grocery store to do, say, a self-checkout, all of those are uh, going to create an ISO 8583 message and an ISO 8583 transaction. And what this is is a standardized set of fields and a standard structure of fields for uh, transmitting the data from your card and from for your transaction over to a payment switch, from that payment switch to a bank, and then on back to approve or reject the transaction that's happening. This is the basis of the fast cash malware, which is what we're going to talk about in, in just a few minutes. But first, uh, just an example on the screen, this is very literally an ISO 8583 message, and this is sort of what all the fuss is about. Uh, so just breaking this down into a couple of different parts, there are three parts to one of these messages. There's a message type identifier, which you can think of as sort of a file header or a message header, and that has some metadata about what type of message uh, something is. There is a bitmap, which will indicate what fields are present in uh, one of these messages. And then there's the data elements, which are those fields. And so the purpose behind items two and items three there are that uh, there are over 100 different options, such as the primary account number, the transaction date and time, and all sorts of other data that can happen or that can be tied to one of these transactions. And so you don't necessarily want to transmit all of these because most transactions don't use all of these fields. And the bitmap just is there to specify which ones are there for the payment switch to look at. Uh, I do need to break down the uh, message type identifier just a little bit further. There are four parts to this. So there is a version, uh, which is the first digit. There is a message classification, a message function, and then finally the source of the message. Where did the message originate from? The bank or the ATM or some other entity. Um, so going into uh, the example message that we had on the screen before, if we break this down into a couple of parts, we can see the first four digits, as I mentioned, are the message type identifier. And so the first digit of those four digits indicates the version. And in this case, this is version 1987 of the ISO 8583 standard. Uh, the second digit here is the classification. And this is really important for the fast cash malware that we're going to be talking about. The classification indicates whether or not something is a financial message, which in this case, it sets it to, so it is, or whether it's a chargeback or an authorization. Uh, the third digit indicates whether something is a request or whether it's a response coming back. And then finally, as I mentioned, uh, the fourth part is the source of the message. So breaking this particular example down, and this is just one that I pulled uh, online and made a couple of changes to, the first thing we have is the bitmap. And this one specifies a couple of fields that are present. So we're going to look at the first three of the four that are specified. Uh, field two, which is the primary account number. Field seven, which is the point of service entry mode and, or excuse me, field seven, which is the transaction date and time, and field 22, which is the point of service entry mode. Um, and if you want to decode a bitmap manually, that's a bit too time, intense, or time uh, intensive, but there are some options there on the bottom of the screen for you to uh, take a look at on, on your own time. Most people though, just run these through a decoder and, and they have it tell them, hey, these are the fields that are in a message. Uh, so real quick here, you can see data element two or field two, and this is the primary account number. The first two digits in this specify how long the primary account number is, and in this case, the first two digits are 16. So the next 16 digits are this user's primary account number. And this is just, again, one from an example online. It's, of course, not a real one. Uh, here you can see uh, just a timestamp in UTC. 
And finally, the point of service entry mode for this transaction. And this one's pretty important for when we get to the Windows fast, fast cache malware. But uh, this point of service entry mode is set to 011. The first two digits in this indicate whether something, or in, indicate how something was entered into the terminal. So in this case, this is a manual entry, meaning someone typed in the data. But if you look at uh, something where the digits are set to 90, that would indicate a card swipe. And so there are a couple other options in that regard. The last digit in this, or the third digit in the point of service entry mode indicates um, whether or not a terminal has pin capabilities. And of course, most terminals these days do have pin capabilities, but this way the device doesn't send a message back saying, hey, can you enter your pin when there's no pin to be entered? Uh, it's sort of a safeguard against that. So those are the core principles that we need to know for working with the fast cache malware. Uh, now, what is the fast cache malware? If you're unfamiliar with this malware family, this belongs to a very specific subset of North Korean threat actors that also engage in swift heists. Sometimes people use fast cache to, um, or they use fast cache as a term for that threat actor. I, I wouldn't necessarily recommend that. And sometimes people use this term Lazarus group for just broad North Korean activity. But this malware is tied to a very specific set of activity from uh, North Korean threat actors. There's a very uh, small cluster of tools and techniques that go along with what they do. Um, so what this malware does is it is injected into a payment switch and it is intended to either fraudulently approve uh, ISO 8583 messages from the attackers sitting at ATMs and allow them to withdraw money or if the transaction isn't originating from an attacker, it can transparently pass that transaction to and from the bank and no one would ever know that anything happened. Uh, that's the general idea behind this malware family and we're gonna look into the reverse engineering and, and how this integrates with uh, ISO 8583. Uh, there are three types that have been, uh, at this point all three are actually in, in public, uh, in, in the public domain. We're gonna look at two of them. We're gonna look at the first AAX type, which was the one that you assert reported uh, back in, I believe, 2018. And we're gonna look at the Windows type, which is one that came out, I guess you could say came out or was used uh, last year. Now, all three of these are tailored to the environments that they work in. And the reason for that is that there are slightly different implementations of ISO 8583, depending on uh, your own architecture and depending on uh, the payment provider that you use. So whether you use uh, Visa or, or MasterCard or STAR or, or something along those lines, there are going to be some different um, implementations or interpretations of the standard. So jumping right into uh, the reverse engineering for AX type one, if you were to open the US cert report and then you were to open the sample yourself in IDA, you're going to see uh, just a, a few small differences. One of them is that the strings that I guess you could say should be there won't be there in your sample. And so this first slide here is just to kind of give you some tips on how you can go and collect those strings. You've got to, you probably write a script for it, but I personally, I just did it manually. You can go into this section of hex, uh, look at the offset that it specifies, and what you get is just uh, a pointer to the string that you're supposed to be working with. So uh, this one is actually a debugging message, and there are a lot of these. Uh, there are a lot of debugging and, and logging messages um, within this malware to help the threat actors operate because what they're doing is fairly complex. But uh, we don't need to worry too much about that. For the purposes of this talk, I've got all of the strings labeled. Uh, what is uh, significantly more interesting is uh, the strings and, and the interaction for how some of the functions that are built into the malware are called. So on this slide, you can see a couple of different function calls, and these are pre-named within the malware. Uh, there is get field string and set field string on this slide. There are a few others, uh, like copy field string. Um, all of those are related to interacting with an ISO 8583 message. And so the important reverse engineering concept that you need when you're uh, looking at one of these is to understand that there is a pattern for how uh, these work. So before set field string is called, for example, there is a load into register three for a digit, and that digit is going to be the field that is manipulated. And above that, there is a load into another register for a string, and that's actually the data that's going to go into that field. So as long as you know that pattern, you can really do the uh, reverse engineering for all of this. And get field string is very similar. There's a load for the fields that is um, going to be uh, retrieved. But in this case, since it's not setting any data, there's no data load. Once you have all of those principles kind of in mind, you can go through and map out how this malware works. And so the way you would read this graph here is from left to right and top to bottom. So uh, 
um, you can think of this as, again, uh, this malware is injected into the payment switch, into software on the payment switch, rather. And uh, a new ISO 8583 message comes in, and this will intercept that message and call this function new read. From there, it will call check sock, and check sock will call get IP, inet address, and, and it will perform a check for a valid IP to make sure that the message is originating from where it's supposed to be. And then it will move on sequentially down the line to check for flags and then read receive and so on and so forth. Uh, we're not going to go into every single one of these. We're going to go into some of the important ones for this payment standard. So again, uh, the first thing here is a check sock function. And I have on the left side of the screen the, I guess you could call it like the overhead for the new read function. Uh, when check sock is called, it performs an IP address whitelisting check. It wants to make sure that the transaction is coming from a valid internal IP address. There's nothing too, uh, too much to worry about there. But as we kind of move along and on the left again on the screen, you can see how we're uh, progressing sort of through this code. Um, once it does the whitelisting check, it's going to retrieve a bunch of information from a couple of different fields. So the, the fields that it, it's mainly interested in at first are the message type identifier, the primary account number, uh, the processing code, and then it also pulls the advice reason code. And depending on what data that it sees there, it has two options. It can either transparently pass this message on to the bank because the primary account number didn't line up with a whitelist that the threat actor set up, for example, or some of the fields that were supposed to be there weren't there. And if any of those things are the case, it will send that on to the bank and uh, nothing. it will be as though nothing ever happened. The bank will send a proper response and that response will go back to the ATM. On the other hand, if it does see data that it's interested in, and we'll dive into the mechanics of that a little bit more in the Windows one, um, it can generate one of three types of responses. So here there are uh, generate response transaction one and response transaction two. And there is also a response inquiry, and I'll dive into those in just a second as well. But depending on this fraudulent response that it generates and sends back to the ATMs, um, it will, uh, assuming all of that works, it will uh, log that it's blocked that message and it will send that response back and then the process will repeat. Uh, so diving into transaction type one and transaction type two is actually very similar to transaction type one. Um, the malware will intercept the ISO 8583 message. It's going to, uh, again, pull those fields that I had mentioned, but then it's also going to copy, it'll dive into this and it'll copy a bunch of data from the original ISO 8583 message. Um, there are some different fields here and I've got a full list on the next slide. All of the data that it copies, it's used to construct the message that's going to go back uh, to these ATMs. And part of that is because the ATMs probably, although we don't know for sure, um, but we can, we can make an assessment that the ATMs probably expect to receive data uh, in a certain way. Again, this is all environment specific stuff, so we have to make some inferences about what the threat actor is doing. Um, so with that in mind, uh, the fields that it's going to copy are the primary account number, processing code, and so on and so forth. It's, there's, a, there's a long list of these things here. Um, and then for transaction type two, it's the same list, but minus a couple of track two fields. Uh, now, once it does that, it reconstructs a message and, and sends that back. It's going to generate a, a random balance for a random transaction amount as part of this process. And then the uh, ATM will allow the threat actor withdraw, to withdraw cash. Uh, so. The other type of uh, response that it can make here is the inquiry response. So this is a response to a balance inquiry. If you walk up to an ATM and you put your card in and you say, hey, how much money do I have? This is uh, actually the type of transaction that would come back. Now, I think the threat actors probably set something like this up to allow them to test their malware. Uh, I, I can't really think of any other uh, reason for doing something like this, but it would be very obvious to a threat actor if this were working properly with a balance inquiry, and you'll see why in just a second. So inside of the balance inquiry, uh, it copies fields in a very similar way to that transaction amount, but there's also this format string, which I have as kind of the multicolored thing on the top right there. So this format string is very important. It's for determining how, uh, or it's for the structure of information that's going to go back into field 54, which is the field that handles uh, all of your account balances. And so breaking this format string down just a little bit, we have uh, three, or we have two kind of non-important um, items and then one very important item. So the non-important ones here, it will say that the uh, amount type is set to zero one, one, which indicates that the amount going back is something called a ledger balance for the purposes of this malware. Uh, not, not too important. We'll see an available balance a little bit later on. Um, 
But the main thing here is uh, the currency code. And so this currency code is set to 356, which is the Indian rupee. And what you can infer from something like that is that for whatever reason, the ATMs on the receiving end of this expect to receive data in that denomination. And so you can make some assumptions and do some open source research. And I can't really go into victimology in a talk like this, but um, that will uh, it will make it pretty clear as to why this might be the case and, and why uh, or, or who this victim probably was. So once those are set, there's also a randomized amount of currency that, that goes along with this and that gets sent back uh, to the ATMs as well as a fraudulent balance inquiry response. So putting all of that together, we have injected the malware into uh, the software on a, on a payment switch. We have done some uh, preliminary checks uh, anytime an ISO 8583 message comes in to see if it's one that we're interested in. If it is one that we're interested in, we've taken some decision points and we've either passed the transaction on or we have uh, blocked the transaction and sent a fraudulent response, either a fraudulent withdrawal um, or a fraudulent balance inquiry. Now, again, I don't have time to go into type two of the AAX malware, but this graph is here in case you want to reverse engineer it on your own time. If you can reverse the first one, you can reverse the second one. Uh, the, the concepts are the same. There are just some structural differences. And this AAX type two is sort of a bridge to the Windows one. And, so from a high level perspective, you can, uh, if you were to look at this graph, you would see that a lot of the payment logic has been consolidated. Um, and so that's really what we're gonna look at for the Windows version as well, uh, is how they consolidated and, and sort of changed this payment logic. So within the Windows version, um, we have, uh, one, once all of that same stuff happens, a whitelist, they've added a blacklisting function in, um, but it's done the IP address check. It's done all of these decision points. It is going to go into what I call the generate response parent. It's sort of a new function that was added into this malware. So the response parent is responsible for uh, taking in uh, some additional data and doing some additional checks before proceeding with whether or not to generate a fraudulent response. The response parent has two checks. The first check is that it is going to look for field zero, uh, the MTI, and it's going to check whether or not field zero's third and fourth digit are set to zero, zero. If we think back to our original example, we had a financial message that was zero, 200, and that indicated that something was a financial request. Uh, so here it's looking to see if something was uh, also zero, 200 or zero, 100 to indicate, uh, hey, that's also a request, as opposed to if it were zero, 210, which would indicate that something was a financial response. The malware doesn't want to indicate, or it doesn't want to intercept a financial response because it wants to just pass that back on uh, to, the to the device that's expecting that response. So that's the first check. The second check is for the point of service entry mode. Now, the point of service entry mode, again, if you think back to that example, it's how the data was entered into a terminal. And here is checking that the data in the point of service entry mode field starts with a nine, which indicates that this was a card transaction rather than manually entering it. And that's just an operational expectation from the threat actor that there aren't people here just manually entering in uh, a whole bunch of data. So assuming those checks pass, uh, it will jump into a uh, response workflow. And this does, there's a little bit of redundancy here, but this will again grab the MTI, and then it's going to grab a whole bunch of fields that you can see here on the screen. And the first check here is to just see, do these fields have data in them? And one of these is field three, which is used in, uh, in just a second as well. But uh, for the most part, that's all this check is uh, concerned with initially. And if these fields don't have data in them, the malware can't, uh, or doesn't expect to be able to process this properly. And so it's going to exit the, it's going to exit this workflow. Now, assuming all those checks are, are met, the next set of uh, uh, the next set of logic here is for looking at that processing code, which is in field three. If the processing code starts with a three, that's going to indicate that this is a balance inquiry, and we'll see a workflow like we looked at before, and that we'll look at again. Uh, if it starts with a zero, it's going to indicate that it needs to do a uh, fraudulent transaction response, and then finally, if it's none of those things, it's going to uh, return. Um, an invalid pin response to the user. So I have here um, all three options kind of on the screen, and, and this is how they look in IDA if you uh, were to screenshot it out. Uh, and we see that format string show up again. I know it's a little bit hard to see on the graphics, so I've kind of uh, put it in multicolor again on this next screen. Um, but we have, as part of our balance inquiry response, instead of the Indian rupee, we have changed the currency to Turkey's currency. 
And that's pretty important. Again, uh, this would indicate that for whatever reason, and most likely it would be tied to victimology, that uh, for whatever reason the malware expects, or the, AT the malware expects to interact with an ATM that in turn expects the currency to be turkeys. And so that's a pretty important threat intelligence uh, factoid there that you can pull out of something like this. Um, and, and it kind of gives you an idea of uh, how this can be a little bit more victim specific than just something that works everywhere. Uh, and again, I have the other, the other two options here for one of those responses. So uh, that essentially is the fast cash malware. Um, next, I'm gonna kind of jump into extensions for financial services, but while I do that, I would consider these three points as sort of a frame of reference for comparison. So the first point is that a lot of things need to go right uh, when, you're, when you're working with malware like this. Uh, it's pretty challenging to interact with all of these devices at that level and to interact with all of these protocols. And so when you're doing that, a lot can go wrong. And that's why the malware has a whole bunch of logging uh, information inside of it uh, to help the threat actors out. Uh, I think those are the two main things. The other thing is that there are some pretty heavy uh, operational requirements that you need to set up. You need programmers that can do this and can make these changes on the fly. You also need a network of money mules, basically people that are there to withdraw the cash from the ATMs. And so if you're a North Korean threat actor, not the easiest thing to set up. And then finally, you need access to this network and you need to get pretty far into the network in order to get access to that payment switch and, and to you know, take a stab at this. So it's pretty challenging, but it does allow the threat actors to operate uh, the ATMs without putting anything on the ATMs and, and to do these cash ads. So with that in mind, the next thing I wanna talk about is something called extensions for financial services. You can think of this as a standardized API for how uh, software vendors are supposed to write their software for interacting with an ATM. So any ATM you go to is able to withdraw cash. It's able to, uh, you can actually deposit uh, cash there, it has all these blinking lights. All of those things go into um, the extensions for financial services uh, standard. And we're actually going to be looking at one called uh, JXFS, which is Java extensions for financial services. Uh, now, we're going to be looking at this in the context of a specific family, but if you're interested more in traditional XFS malware, uh, there are some uh, links that I have here, and there are a couple of common API calls. None of these actually appear in this particular family, but they are ones that you'll see fairly often uh, within other ATM malware that's out there. But we're interested in this malware family called Injexpeer. Now, I, I can't go too much into the incident uh, that uh, in, in which this malware was used, but this is an ATM malware family that relies on both XFS and a proprietary ATM implementation. Um, the reason I wanna go into this is less to talk about how the malware dispenses cash because I think that's been kind of done to death in, in open source and it's not super interesting. What I wanna talk about instead is what people can do to an ATM once they get this level of access. And so that's really the context that we're going to be uh, looking at this malware and are kind of the frame of mind we should have uh, and, and we'll see some pretty interesting capabilities there that aren't necessarily built into this malware, but could have been. So with Injects Pure, the operators can do some pretty traditional, um, or they can perform some pretty traditional actions. Of course, it's ATM malware, so they can dispense cash. Uh, they can query device information, and uh, that's really used to kind of find out how much cash is in the ATM. Uh, and they can execute arbitrary code. Uh, all of those things are pretty common to any ATM malware family. And, and honestly, aside from dispensing cash, they're common to any malware family just in general. Um, but we're going to focus, uh, we're gonna dial in on the cash dispensing function and the XFS components that follow that. Uh, if you are interested in a full reverse engineering of it, it's again, it's been kind of done to death in, uh, in open source. And so here are three uh, just references for that. The third one we are actually going to reference again, and that one's a very good one. And, uh, so we'll come back to that. But the important thing that you need to know about this malware is that the threat actors uh, essentially deployed this malware to a bunch of ATMs. And the malware, uh, when it runs, it creates an HTTP server. And that server can accept GET and POST requests that carry out those commands that I mentioned before. And that's really the core concept. There are two workflows to kind of get you to this spot if, uh, from, from the malware's viewpoint. The one we're gonna be looking at is the one that is just directly responsible for um, all of the different commands. Uh, so we're gonna dial in on this dispensing commands, but the other ones are up there. Um, this sits within the server that's created, and, and I have that here on the screen. Basically, it, it opens a listener on a high port and just listens for those requests. Uh, so within this dispensing commands, there are two uh, possible branches that the malware can take. 
it can uh, query, it, I, I call it querying the device information, but it's really querying the cassette information and it can dispense cash. And so dialing in just on the first one, the query, uh, we can see a couple of different XFS callouts here. So we have uh, get cash unit, we have uh, a, a dispenser uh, call, and we have get number of cash units. So uh, these are things where if you're looking at the code, uh, these are not standard uh, Java calls, whereas pretty much everything else is. Uh, and they're not standard JavaScript calls. And again, pretty much everything else is in, in that regard as well. Uh, so these look like they could be XFS um, implementations. So how do, we, how do we figure that out? Well, if we take get cache unit and we throw it into the magic Google box, uh, you will get this Google book. Uh, it, it's some sort of ATM book. I think it's in German. It's from like 2004. Um, and you can see here that uh, call to get cache unit within this JXFS implementation within this book uh, will return this dot cache unit. Uh, not super illuminating if you're trying to figure out what this is doing, but it at least indicates that this is probably, uh, we're probably on the right path to determining that this is XFS. Uh, so the next stop, and probably the, the better stop once you know about it, is to go to the actual documentation. And so if you go to the send documentation and you look at book five, uh, which uh, holds all of the different, uh, I guess, API calls for this malware, or sorry, for uh, XFS, if you go in there and you look for get cash unit, you will indeed see an entry in the official documentation for get cash unit. And this, uh, with a little bit more research, this essentially returns the information about the uh, money that is stored in the ATM in different cassettes. And there is there are some differences between how this is written out here and how the malware, uh, or sorry, yeah, how the malware uses it and how the uh, proprietary ATM software uses it. But essentially. Uh, this you could call this an XFS implementation, and, and I would be comfortable saying that the developers for the ATM probably just built their implementation on top of uh, on top of XFS rather than in, in place of XFS. So that handles one of the API calls. But what about get number of cash units? Uh, I've got to give a huge shout out to Frank Baldwin who did a presentation last year, um, more specifically on how this malware works and and the context in which it was used. But one of the things he discovered was that the uh, ATM software as part of the incident response was actually uploaded to VirusTotal. So I'm not going to just paste some all of the vendor's code um, you know, all over the place on here, but I'm, I'm going to show the relevant things. So get cache unit uh, sits within this ATM's code for peripheral, uh, under the context of peripheral.notesdeposit.getCacheUnit. And the same goes for get number of cache units. And what I want to talk about here is less about what these are doing, but and more about uh, what the threat actors could have done. Uh, so under that peripheral .notes deposit call are a bunch of other uh, fairly mundane calls uh, in terms of interacting with the ATM, but they would allow the threat actors to to query a lot of these types of uh, a lot of these types of information. So most of these aren't super exciting. Um, there's some extra calls for retrieving more information about the cache units. Uh, if you haven't heard enough about the cache units. Uh, you can get the media status, you can get some other settings. Nothing too groundbreaking, but it does give the threat actors a little bit more information. So uh, the next step here, if you're interested in threat actor capabilities on an ATM, is to actually back that up a set, uh, like one notch. And instead of looking at peripherals.notesdeposit, you would look on the ATM software for just what the peripherals did. And again, this is something the threat actors had access to. So. Uh, looking at just the peripheral class, instead of notes deposit, there are some other options. You can call peripherals.screen and peripherals.host, .system service, and .pinpad. And under each of those are some actions that you can take. The most important ones, I think, are this idea of disabling and enabling keys. Uh, why might a threat actor want to do something like that? Well, if you're trying to coordinate a cache out, uh, it, what you might want to do is maximize the amount of cash that is actually sitting in an ATM. And if you just let people use the ATM all day, you might be sending a money mule to an ATM to pick out cash, or to pick up cash rather, and there might be none in there, or there might not be as much in there as it could be. So this creates an option for threat actors to perhaps disable and enable keys on an ATM to stop it from functioning the way it's supposed to, so that other people try and use it and have to walk away from it. Um, that is sort of a high variance strategy because if you have an ATM that's not working, you raise the risk that someone's gonna go look at it. Uh, but depending on how you're timing this, if you do that, say, late at night uh, or earlier in the morning, those are some options that a threat actor could take if they're willing to kind of roll the dice a little bit on how much money they're taking out. Uh, there are some other things that I haven't listed here. They're a bit more mundane. Um, one is uh, you know the blinking, blinking lights on an ATM. You can make those 
blank all you want, but from a security standpoint, you know, go for it. I, it's, we're more worried about people taking the money out, I think. Um, but those, I, I think that really speaks to the capabilities that a threat actor has there. Uh, so kind of just circling back on, um, uh, or kind of closing the loop on the rest of this, we have uh, one other part of the dispense function, which is just the actual dispensing of cash. And so dispense itself is possibly an XFS implementation. I can find it in the documentation, but it's implemented um, significantly differently, I think within the uh, proprietary code that, that's available. So it's a little bit unclear if this one is built on top of XFS or built in place of XFS. Um, but again, it, you know, it speaks to the threat actor capabilities when they're interacting with a device like this. And so that is really what I wanted to talk about from the extensions for financial services approach. So if we think about the fast cash malware and we think about this kind of in the same context, in fast cash, we were able to send people to an ATM and they would you know, run a card into it. And as long as it's one of the threat actors cards, it would fraudulently approve a transaction. Here, we uh, have a threat actor who developed proprietary malware. Um, they were, uh, the way this works is they would have sent people to those ATMs at a specified time to have the cash uh, come out of an ATM and, and you know, via post request, and then they would withdraw that cash themselves. And so that's sort of the comparison approach there. Um, one of the problems here is there's some increased development time because they had to develop malware specific for this ATM. Um, and they also had to work with some proprietary implementations when they did that, that might not necessarily be documented. So that's a little bit challenging and testing is always a little bit challenging. Um, and, and so those are some of the things that kind of come up there, but you know, ultimately they did have the opportunity to uh, run an attack like this. And so with that, I will teleport myself back to the future and back to another room. And I'll have uh, just this slide up there if you want to see some concluding thoughts. But at this point, uh, thank you for listening to my talk. And I'm happy to take as many questions as I can. All right. Uh, so first of all, thank you all. Uh, there are two things I want to just uh, mention before I go into a couple of the questions that came up during the talk. The first is there is a slight, slight error on one of the slides, which is data element 60 I have listed as uh, being the advice reason code. That is the advice reason code uh, for certain payment switches, but not all of them. That's actually a private reserve field. That is corrected in the slides that are uh, going to be uploaded. The second thing I would mention is that there's a white paper that covers a little bit more on uh, AAX type two and also has some of the some additional context and tooling listed. So uh, feel free to check that out when that goes up online tonight. Um, there are a couple of questions that came in and we're on about a uh, 45 second delay here. So if you hear me say this and you have a question, it means you should type it. Um, one of the questions that came up is, uh, can I elaborate on what a payment switch is? So that's a great question. Um, I probably could have done a little bit of a better job on that. A payment switch is a device that sits in between uh, all of the payment devices and a bank that needs to approve transactions. So um, you've got ATMs and you've got um, uh, your grocery store point of sale devices and this payment switch will process all of the messages coming into those and decide whether or not to forward those onto a bank. And then when the bank decides whether or not uh, it wants to approve or disapprove a transaction request, it'll send that to the payment switch and the payment switch will send it out. It's a way of just processing all of the different types of data that are coming in. And so that's why it's so important to the ecosystem. So another good question that came up was, well, should we just change the ISO 8583 standard? Uh, I would never recommend that, and it would also be impossible even if I thought that were a good idea. Um, but the ISO 8583 standard is the card payment standard for absolutely everything. Um, there are some things that go along with card payments, um, such as um, uh, e like EMV transactions, for, for example. And that was something I thought someone uh, might ask, and, and I think this is kind of related to it. Um, there are different ways to do these card transactions that could randomize the data. Um, but ultimately, um, and, and by randomized data, I mean, they might make it less predictable for what's supposed to be going back to an ATM. So uh, those things might make it harder to do these types of attacks. Um, but ultimately, what's happening here is that the payment switch is compromised. And there's nothing wrong at all with uh, the payment standard being used. The ATMs are working the way they're supposed to be. And in a very real sense, they're processing these messages. Um, so that rolls into the next thing, which was, um, I think uh, Kat was the one that asked, uh, how do you even detect an attack like this? 
the I don't give official recommendations, but um, I touch on this a little bit in, in the white paper. All of the uh, um, mechanisms for getting to this point where your payment switch is compromised, uh, all of those are, or almost all of the tooling used by this threat actor, uh, the fast cash threat actor specifically, involves PowerShell, it involves scheduled tasks or created services. And th those are all pretty standard things that you can and should be looking for in, in your enterprise. So if you've got that kind of endpoint detection, uh, then it just becomes a question of identifying uh, those anomalies and, and having the right analysts and having those analysts do the right analysis on all of those things. So uh, by the time it gets to the payment switch and this cash out happens, you'll detect it because the money, will, you know, all your ATMs will be empty all of a sudden. Um, and so you don't, the idea is to stop it before it gets to that point. It's, I'm probably not supposed to say it's too late, but it is basically too late at that stage. Um, now, um, I have another question here from Sean, which is how does Index Pure actually get onto a payment switch or the ATM? So Index Pure doesn't get onto a payment switch. And I think that's good to touch on too. Um, Index Pure is uh, different adversaries uh, method. So this is a Latin America adversary. I, I can't really talk about the context for a couple different reasons, but um, they deployed the malware um, directly onto uh, the ATMs. Um, I don't think I can really disclose how they did that, but I can tell you that that's not a novel, like a bull ATM malware deployment is not necessarily a novel technique. Um, so thinking about one that's in open source, uh, if you can read Korean, um, a couple of years ago, there was there was one in South Korea where there was an issue where they used, I think, the antivirus um, management tool to deploy malware to a bunch of ATMs. So I'm not going to comment on whether or not that's what happened here, um, but that's the type of attack you're looking at to get that there. Now, what that means, though, and the difference between these two attacks is that someone's got to be there to pick up that cash that's getting automatically dispensed. And if you go on Twitter, you can see some examples of uh, where someone wasn't there and cash just got, like, spat out onto the ground. Um, so wanted to touch on that um, and clarify that. Um, and no, that question wasn't too late. Um, I think that uh, there's one other thing I did want to talk about here, which is um, this question of, you know, so we've got all this technical intelligence and I've got kind of a minute or two to touch on this. Like how does, um, how does all of this like fit into a threat intelligence picture? So it's, not enough to just track that uh, there are all these technical characteristics of this malware and to understand how it works. You certainly need to do that, but you also need, if you're in this industry, to be um, doing really good collection with uh, other peer financial institutions because this data is rare and these attacks are rare, um, but they're so impactful. So that will help you build an operational picture out of it. And it will also help you build a, a strategic intelligence picture in terms of starting to make business decisions or starting to make security level decisions at a, at a bigger scale um, on, on these types of topics. And with that, I think we have uh, run through questions and I think we are about out of time. So I just want to say thanks again for uh, everyone for tuning into this. I know it's tough to sit through a lot of webcasts, but it really means a lot to me and I really appreciate it. So thank you.